If you are accustomed to a clean kitchen, you might have to spend the next few hours being very uncomfortable. But <laughs> but Nancy knows because Nancy's been here many times. <laughs> 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 yeah, I just don't put things away because I use them all the time. Yeah. yeah. Take one bite and um, I want everybody to taste this. Mmm. Ooh, it's good. It's good. Welcome to Saltgrass, a show about how local communities can engage with the climate crisis at a grassroots level. My name is Ali Hanley. In this episode, we're talking with Duang, who moved to Castlemaine just a few years ago, but is already an integral part of the fabric of our community. She sells delicious Thai cooking at the weekly farmer's market, and she came here, as you'll hear, in part because she knew about the Harcourt Farming Cooperative and the community-supported agriculture schemes that they employ. One of the Harcourt Farming Cooperative members is Gung Ho Growers, who grow vegetables. The idea behind Community Supported Agriculture, or CSAs, is that as a customer, you pay in advance for a season's worth of boxes to be picked up from the farmer's market each week. And in paying for it in advance, you're helping the farmers have some security and you're also investing in them, in that if the crops fail, you don't get a refund. You wear the losses and the wins along with the farmer. To hear more about this concept and the Harcourt Organic Farming Cooperative, you could go back to a couple of the earliest saltgrass episodes. Back in season one in 2018, I spoke to both Gung Ho Growers and the orchard owner, Katie Finlay, and Ant, who was about to start managing the orchard. They were only just beginning the co-op. It was the very earliest days. Ant especially was a very enthusiastic advocate for community supported agriculture or CSA as a more sustainable system to support small scale local farmers. So if you want to listen back to those, I invite you to go back to season one of Saltgrass and have a listen and keep your ears peeled because in the next few weeks we'll be sharing a couple of updates from the Harcourt Farming Cooperative as well and things have grown and changed quite a bit since those early days. I'm telling you all this because not only was the fact of the Harcourt Cooperative and the CSAs one of the reasons that Duang moved to this area with her husband and she wants to live in a community that has this sort of thing happening, it's also the reason I met Duang and had the opportunity to speak to her and hear some of her stories initially was because I was subscribed to a gung-ho vegetable box and... Duang was so keen to support the farmers that she offered a free zero waste cooking class to CSA members at her own home. And it was her way to help the farmers offer more value to the people who subscribed. And as a subscriber, I went along and it was a fun class with Duang and she peppered all the cooking advice with stories from her life. And we made pesto out of carrot tops and talked about what makes a good life and how to use every last scrap of your vegetables in your cooking. And Duang has a wonderful way of telling her stories and she certainly had a varied and adventurous life. So another segue is that Duang and I sat down to record some of these stories for an SBS series I produced called New Home. And we talked about her life and how she ended up in central Victoria from her earliest life as a child in a tiny town in Thailand called Nan and then moving to the US when she was a young adult and marrying and living 35 years around Seattle where she, amongst other things, worked with migrants and refugees from Southeast Asia and facilitated families there in creating their own farms. So if you like today's episode, I recommend that you listen to that new home episode with her. I have a link in the episode description of the podcast and at saltgrasspodcast.com if you want to find it and have a listen to it. And she does talk about different things to what we talk about today in this episode. So in summary, today's episode is about a person who deeply values local food systems and who is now focusing her life on sharing her knowledge and her philosophies around food. To record this interview, I went to her house once more and we sat on her broad deck looking out over her vegetable beds. And unfortunately, it was a little bit too breezy that day to get a really good recording. So as you'll hear, we move inside pretty rapidly. As ever, I want to acknowledge that saltgrass is produced on Jara country, the home of the Jaja Rung, 
They have been zero waste ecosystem guardians and custodians of this land for countless generations and continue to lead the way and generously share their wisdom on how to live here better. I give thanks to them and honour elders past and present. Always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Salt, salt, salt of the earth. Salt, salt, salt. Grassroots, salt of the earth people. Grassroots change. Salt grass. Listen to all episodes of Salt Grass on your podcast app or at saltgrasspodcast.com. When my husband and I were getting ready to leave our bush block in research, we looked all over Victoria to where we would go. We didn't have any particular idea of where we would go. And Kasumen ticked many of the boxes, you know, including being very progressive, quite inclusive. And, and the bonus was that I saw when I was here that there was this CSA program started by the Gang Ho growers. And they were just getting to start. And I just thought, oh, that's it. I need to go somewhere where there are farmers and that there's a concept of community-supported agriculture, which I'm really passionate about. So that was kind of like the, the icing on the cake, even though I don't eat cake. Just the thing that just made the decision for me, that this would be the right place. And tell me about community supported agriculture, because I know you've got a long history with that and you actually even accidentally stumbled into yeah, I, <laughs> creating I, a system similar yes, to it. I, I didn't know what community supported agriculture was, ab- was about, but I was in a situation where I needed to help Hmong refugees in Seattle get started on their sustainable income. And the thing that they knew how to do the best was to farm. And so I got them a piece of land, I got them some seeds and some equipment, but I didn't think about what I was going to do when the produce actually came off the ground and we were going to harvest. And so I was a teacher at the time, English as a second language. So I asked my teachers to help buy these vegetables. And of course, when the farmers harvest the vegetables, they need to buy more seeds to put in. So instead of buying the vegetable on the day and paying for that, I asked the teachers if they would pay for a month at a time in advance so that they would give the farmers some money to reinvest into what they were doing. The teachers were quite happy to do that. Then it went beyond the teachers. The teachers sold it to their friends and their families. And we got a community of people who wanted to invest in the farmers by buying subscription one month at a time. And the ball just started rolling and I just thought, wow, this is great. Then I read about it, that it had been done in Europe for quite a long time. And we didn't know how to do it, we just did it. (laughs) I really like the concept of the community who need to eat, invest in the livelihood of the people who produce our food that we're just not sitting back as a passive consumer and just let the farmers do what they do with their wins and loses, but that we are invested with them money-wise and also support emotionally and other ways, yeah. It's interesting, it's such a different model, isn't it, than, as you said, the consumer being so detached from the process of farming that you don't even know where, how things are grown things or are where grown. they're grown or yes. who's growing it. Yes. yes. Community supported agriculture has never been more prominent in my mind mm. than this last year, this last few months. Mm. Big rain came and my rain gauge come up to a hundred. What I think of is the farmers, you know, what the farmers who've lost all their crops through this. And what are we as consumers doing about it? It really... We're just complaining about the price of... Yes, 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 yes. I know a young farmer in board who invested a great deal, in fact, all of her money into growing garlic this year. And her entire crop of garlic was underwater. Lost the whole lot. Oh, yeah. that's heartbreaking. It is, yeah. yeah. Yeah, 
It is. Oh. Due to increasing wind, which was audible, and also being quite cold, we decided to move inside to finish the interview. Thuang's kitchen is a large open plan space with an island bench that's big enough to host a cooking class with five or six people all standing around chopping and prepping and eating delicious food. She's so humble about her skills, but she served me that day a breakfast that was fit for a five-star restaurant. It was really delicious. You have moved to the area because you were excited about community-supported agriculture happening around here. But then you got involved and you've been interacting with them. Tell me how that relationship developed. I started being Gung Ho customer before I started to do the market meals. And so then when I started to do the market from the very beginning, their vegetable was always a feature of whatever it was I put in my food. And I tailored my recipe to what was available from the farm. Yeah. yeah. It was a really good way to start, and I just felt really good about what I was doing. Yeah. But then you also became friends with them. Yes, yes, we are good friends. And Scarly is my best dog. <laughs> you just haven't spent enough time with my dog. <laughs> Scarly's a beautiful dog. <laughs> She's a stick obsessed <laughs> Staffy. She's gorgeous. Yes, yes. And so then obviously you started collaborating on workshops and other yes, things like that. Yes. Well. I I wanted to do anything that I could to get more value for the money for the people who invest in the CSA and also to in whatever I can do to entice people to be subscribers of the CSA. But I'm seeing now that they don't need my help. People really know that the vegetable they get is the best quality. And the people who are subscribers have the same kind of mind. So my help is dwindling, that, which is good, but I'm still going to do the same workshop for the next year. It's already scheduled. We've already spoken at length about your childhood in Thailand, and mm -hmm. if anyone's interested in hearing about your life story as a migrant to Australia from Thailand, they can listen to the SBS episode I did, and mm -hmm. I'll link to that. Okay. But let's go back there a little bit, because your love of food and your appreciation of food really started in childhood, didn't it? It did, yes, it did. Not, not only from the fact that I was the grower of the food that I sold, but my mother was an exceptional woman in that she was passionate about vegetables, about ingredients that she cooked. I almost like to say that she has a relationship with all the vegetables that she cooked. For example, we didn't have very much ingredients because we lived in a remote area of Thailand with not much communication from the outside world. So the truck would come to Nan once a week or once every fortnight that bring things from Bangkok. Otherwise, we just had to depend on what it was that was indigenous to that hometown. So my mother only had salt, and she made her own soybean sauce that would go as an enhancer in the cooking. But before she would cook, she would say to a cauliflower, hmm, what kind of taste would you like to be today? You know, before she put in. And then she would start at cooking and she would have a conversation with her vegetable, with her ingredients, and come up with a fantastic meal. And I was just a bystander, I was just an observer, because she would ask me, you know, go wash this or go fetch me this or that. But Watching a mother who loved to cook, loved everything that she put into her pot, and then enjoy feeding people afterwards, just really imprinted that in me. I have always loved food. Yeah, I might not have always lived the life that I live now, which is everything I do is about food, but I've always loved food. That's amazing. I love that story about her talking to the vegetables. Yeah, it's almost like she has a telepathy mm -hmm. with the vegetables. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like they tell her yeah. and she believed in it. Yeah, I think it's interesting. And even just in stopping to ask the vegetables, what would you like to be? She's really just feeling into it mm. as well. You yeah. know, she's giving herself the time to not just say, oh, this is the recipe I'm going to cook. Yeah. She's taking the time to really feel into what have we got here? What, mm. what does it want mm -hmm. you know like mm -hmm. whether she's 
actually communing with the vegetables or not, she's just taking the time to really tune in, isn't mm-hmm. she? Mm-hmm. And also, when, when she serves her food, she really enjoys watching people's faces of how, how they eat her food. And so it just, oh, it was just so rewarding, you yeah. know, for her and rewarding for me. And I learned what food can do. Because my family was a hardworking family. Everybody came to sit down for just 10 minutes to eat. But it's a 10 minutes that they don't have to work. And it's a 10 minutes that they get to really enjoy the fantastic food that my mother made. And everyone took notice. Yeah, Mm -hmm. (laughs) It was not just feeding your face, you know. It's what my mother came up with, yeah. yeah. We were nine siblings, and I was number eight. Yeah, so she fed 11 people, each child has his or her own business, and mine was vegetable. So some people were selling fruit. We had a mango orchard. And some people were fixing bicycles, and that was their business. And sewing was my sister's business. My older siblings, they finished school early, third grade or fifth grade, and two other older brothers finished high school. They needed bodies and hands to work. So it really was seasonal subsistence living. What was there is what you were able to have. Yes, yes, yes. As I I get older and older, I appreciate so much more about what my parents did. It's been in the back of my mind all the time, but it hasn't really sunk in of how all of this meant until lately. Little things that I do that remind me of my mother or my father. I think back of what that really meant at the time. And I'll give you this one example. So as I said, we all had different businesses that we were doing. And at night, in those days, it was before there was any bank in Nan. And my family had a safe where they put all the cash. And we did cash transaction in everything. At night, after dinner, all the nine children would bring the proceeds of what they sold that day to the family pot. And my mother put it all in one bag and then just pour out the cash on the floor. And the kids would sit down on the floor and we were given a task of, you, you count the 100 baht bills and you do the 20s and you do the 10s and this person does all the coins. And what that meant was that no one got the first prize of bringing in the most, and no one was the person who did the least. Everything was equal. And so <laughs> I'm just, I, I feel very emotional right now thinking about that, that I was probably the person who brought in the least, but I was never made to feel that I wasn't worth very much or I didn't bring in very much. That whatever effort I put in was equal to the person who brought in the very most. I'm sorry. <laughs> Don't apologize. Yeah. I, that's, yeah, that is yeah. such a beautiful way, especially with kids. Mm-hmm. If you've got nine of them, they're gonna, some of them are going to be teenagers and you're going to yes. be five yes. or four. Like you can't possibly. And my parents never went to school, but they were so good at parenting in that way of not minimizing anyone's effort. Yeah. I think it's such a thing about wisdom. You know, like yes. being, being a good human is not taught at schools. Yeah. And people think you have to go to school, you have to go to school to be a worthwhile human, uh, uh. to have a worthwhile job. Yeah, wisdom is a great word. Yeah. yeah. The other thing that I think was remarkable that I'm re- appreciating more is how my mother especially taught with no words. She just taught with actions. What I just told you, there was no words attached. It was just the action that she did that really stayed. I am now assembling food to sell the market. And this last Tuesday when I was assembling the meal, I noticed that if I had turned something around, it would make my assembling much faster. And I remember that my mother used to do that. She used to just walk by to see whatever it was that I was doing. And if I would have saved one second extra, had I turned something this way, she would have turned it for me without saying a word. And then I would know that once she turned it around, it does make the flow go faster or smoother. And, well, it's been 20 years since my mother died. And it's only been now that I am picking that up. 
of how valuable it is to to teach by action and not by words. Mm. Yeah. I, f- I find that so interesting, especially as you come into your role as a teacher of cooking, that your mother is becoming more and more present for you. Yes. Even 20 years after her passing. Yes. Let's go forward because you've had a lot of different journeys and paths and careers and things, Mm -hmm. but you've had a few adventures as a chef. So you ended up marrying and living in the United States for some time. Yes. 35 years. 35 years. (laughs) And in that time you had some interesting adventures as a chef. Yes. But what got you interested in cooking as a profession, I guess? I guess I never did it as a profession, mm. uh, but I've always been interested in food and I've always wanted to learn how to cook things that I didn't grow up with. So one of my favorite pastimes is to go out to eat in restaurants that produce food that I don't make. And whenever I go to these restaurants, I always wonder, gee, how I could kind of taste the ingredients, but I don't know how it's put together. So I've always been curious, and I had a good fortune, as I said before, as being an English as a second language teacher, so I could learn from my students who would cook once in a while for me. But that was limited at the time to Southeast Asian cooking and Sudanese cooking. And so whenever I could, when I get to know somebody, and I know that they have a friend who owns a restaurant or something, I would say, Hey, tell your friend that if the chef ever want to go on vacation, I would go in as a substitute, which was pretty bold. But a few people took me up on it. The first (laughs) restaurant that took me up on this was in Alaska. And they had a Spanish restaurant. And so they were cooking all kinds of Spanish tapas. And one of their features was paella. And so what I got out of that was that the chef actually taught me all of his menu, my condition that that I put forward was that I wanted to maintain the restaurant's menu rather than impose my menu onto the restaurant because I wanted to learn their craft. So the chef taught me all the Spanish cooking lessons and then went on vacation and I assumed their role. And so that is how I learned how to cook Spanish food, which I absolutely love. And then Mediterranean and Asian food had some similarities in that we use a lot of vegetables. And so I could compare and contrast and then come up with my own version of Spanish food or introduce some of the Spanish food into the Asian food that I cook. And so then once one restaurant start, I guess they tell their friends. And so this Spanish restaurant had a friend who was in San Francisco who had a Mexican restaurant. And so I did that too. And so I call myself a locum chef. I go and substitute for chefs who wanted to go on vacation. So I learned that. And the other thing I did in Seattle, being the capital of technology, of IT in the world at the time, there were a lot of startup companies whose owners were time poor. And so they had these big, beautiful houses with state-of-the-art kitchens, but nobody ever cooked. So I would hire myself out as a cook whenever they had a party at their home or a meeting, and I get to use all their equipment and then disappear when they eat a phantom cook. <laughs> so great. And was the, can you tell the story about the Japanese breakfast? Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> so... <laughs> So a company who did business with Japanese people had flown over some Japanese CEOs and they took them on a fishing trip in Alaska and hired me as their cook just for breakfast. They had somebody else do the sandwiches at the lunchtime and a fantastic cook at dinner time. But I was hired to be a breakfast cook. And I quickly learned that the Japanese people, they were all Japanese men, would prefer to have Asian breakfast. So I cooked congee most of the time, and using rice, of course, 
and then because it was a fishing trip, the fish were fresh out of the sea, and we just used that fish in our congee. And so it was not difficult, and it was, you know, but very easy and very pleasurable kind of a gig. And then I get to be the sous chef for the dinner chef, so I learned some Japanese cooking then too. Very sneaky. I love it. You really learnt by stealth, didn't you? (laughs) And how interesting to then be in the kitchens of all these different chefs from all different cultures Mm -hmm. and learn how they teach as well. Do you feel like that's impacted how you teach, having learnt from so many different... Yes, yes. The Spanish cook prefer to say to me, let me show you how to do this, than to say, chiffonade, the vegetable or whatever fancy vocabulary that was specific to culinary. Mm. So now I do the same. You know, when people come and help me cook, I said, let me just show you how to do it rather than find a word that both you and I would understand. Yeah. Because I actually don't have culinary vocabulary. Yeah. yeah. And when they're teaching people who are not in the chefing world yes like I don't really know what braising means <laughs> you know what I mean yes and so if someone says just braise the blah blah I'd be like I don't know what you mean <laughs> yes. yeah. you've given such beautiful stories about your mother's love for the food mm-hmm. and that community connectivity mm-hmm. of mm-hmm. food as well and yeah. how the CSAs do that but uh-huh. also just feeding people does yes. that I'm going to try not to cry because it's so dear to my... I'm in my 70s now. I never think of myself as a community person in that I am more of an introvert than an extrovert. And up to now, I kind of keep very much to myself and I don't go out and share with people who I am or what it is that's important to me. But. I feel that since I've moved to Casamain, I have all of a sudden become a community person. I love being part of this community, and in a way, I am conscious that I want to pay back to all the help that I have had from communities before I come to Casamain, as well as how much the community here has given me. And how do I give to the community when I'm a relative newcomer? I've been here four years. And I do an inventory of the kinds of things that I know how to do and my passion in life. And I've decided that my passion is food. And I only have a limited number of years left. I'm going to devote the rest of my life in food, in everything there is to know about food. And the more I can impart my love of food and my knowledge of food. I, I don't think that I would be boastful in saying, because I've cooked for so long, that I have a lot of tricks. People like to say secrets, but it's not secrets to me. There's no secret in food. You know, how could there be secrets in food? It's just tips, really. It's just things other people don't yeah, know yet. Yeah, <laughs> The other word that people here use, which I didn't understand for a long time, is hack. Hacks, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I do have some of those that I would love the opportunity to just chair. And I chair by doing the market every Wednesday at the farmer's market and talking to people. I have cooking classes here that I haven't started really since COVID, but I should do that next year. But I just love talking about food and I would do anything of any opportunity that come my way having to do with food. Mm. Because I, I have made a conscious decision that for the rest of my life. This is your gift. This is my gift, yeah. It's my gift that has been given to me and it's a gift that I'm ready to give out. Mm. Yeah. My recipes are terrible because they have not been tested. I don't cook with recipes, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. and so I just kind of make it up thinking that this makes sense. Yes, and yeah. in here, the very last item on the custard menu, the steamed egg, is black fungus. And I didn't have it. So when I, when I got to make this this morning, I opened my cupboard, I took everything out. I can't find it. Oh my God, what am I going to do? So. 
this is how you um, you substitute recipes. Mm-hmm. I asked myself, why is the black fungus in there? And the reason it's in there is because it's crunchy. Yeah. It doesn't have any taste. It's crunchy. Mm-hmm. So I have to find something crunchy to, to put in place, right? So what I found is um, uh, water chestnut. Yeah. So water chestnut doesn't have any taste either, and it's crunchy. Mm-hmm. So all I need is texture. So when you get a recipe, any recipe, or the lengthy recipe, <laughs> you know, that has a list of, of ingredients that you need, and you don't have whatever, just ask yourself, why is this in there? Yeah. And just use the next best thing that you have mm-hmm. in the garden or in your cupboard. Yeah. And so you recently went back home to Nan, I did, yeah. And you've, you've had inspired idea to take people there and show people a different cultural way of understanding mm-hmm. food, really. Mm-hmm. Tell me a little bit about, about that trip and about your yeah. idea. I am the lucky inheritant of my family home. And this home was built 75 years ago and it's never been renovated or refurbished or kept up. So there's a lot of maintenance to do. And in maintaining this house, to keep it going for another many generations, I've decided to make the kitchen big enough and comfortable enough to be a gathering place for friends and families. My family home was a working place. It was not a comfortable place. But now I wanted to make it a comfortable place for people to come and cook and eat and not limited to only Thai people. I wanted to welcome my friends and other people who are interested in food and culture to come to Nan to see how a remote village in Thailand cooks, grow food and cooks. And I have really fallen in love with my hometown for the first time in my 70s, yeah. And because before it was just a place that I lived and a place where I went to visit my parents and my mother especially. And then I, I just came and went rather than really explore. And when I explore Nan, oh my gosh, it's got such a food tradition and very proud of what Nan can bring, yeah. And it's interesting because I guess it's so natural as a young person to all you want to do is get out and see the world. And yes. So much of your family was about, no, you stay here and you help support the family. And so it was an effort for you. You really had to work to leave and, and find a different sort of life. And the whole world was so big and so exciting. Yes. And it's taken a lifetime for you to come back there. and It has taken a lifetime, hasn't it? Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, I'm a slow learner. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you had other things to do first. Yeah. I don't know that you'd be able to go back there and, and love it the way you do without that yeah. context, without yes. understanding the bigger mm-hmm. world and then knowing when you come back to Nan what it's really worth. Mm-hmm. You wouldn't have that context if you hadn't done it. No, you're right, you're right. I have really deeply fallen in love with Nan, but I'm not just trying to romanticize it. Mm-hmm. There are challenges about Nan too, one of which that I find personally almost like my mission is to help minimize the use of plastic. When you go to the market in Nan, everything is put into plastic and then the plastic put in another plastic and then another plastic and you come home with 20 plastic bags or single-use plastic. And the saddest conversation I had this last time I was there was with a woman who is even older than I am. And I asked her, do you remember what you used to wrap your food before plastic came along? And she couldn't give me an answer. Mm -hmm. And I thought, how sad that we no longer use banana leaves, which is all over the place you know, to wrap food because it's easier. And people don't seem to want to think about where the plastic ends up in. Yeah. So I know that one person being me going back to Nan is not going to be able to change. Because that's just one small village across all of Thailand. But if I could change one person at a time 
and then just have it as a ripple effect. Mm. I think that would be good. What I've noticed is that when Thai people come here to visit me, it isn't what I say, it's what I do in the kitchen that really impress them, like the compost bin and how we separate our recyclable from trash and how little we want to try to put things into the landfill. That they go home to Thailand and they try to do the same thing. So if I could just keep doing that, and if I invite people into my home in Nan, and I do separate all my discards and don't use any plastic and try to go back to soap that is in a bar rather than a plastic bottle, maybe that would be the most effective thing I could do. And I'm going to do that. Yeah, great. So you're bringing those things to Nan, but you're also hoping that the people who come with you to learn yes. will take something from Nan and yes. from the way they live. Maybe yes. not use of plastic, but other things. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Definitely no waste cooking. People in Nan, if you meat eater, use everything in an animal. And when they cook vegetables, it is from root to tip mm. cooking. I'm going to invite some older cooks to show us how they cook. And I think just by watching how people save stems and roots and how they reuse them and how the water is recycled in the kitchen and rather than tip everything down the sink would be good. Yeah. It's interesting, is it? Because with water coming out of a tap, it's really easy just to refill the pot and use a fresh one. But if you've got to walk down to the well and pump water, (laughs) you're going to use every little bit. (laughs) Yes, yes. Yes. Intercultural is good, yes. Mm. Yeah, so I would like people to come with an open mind and also I want the people in Nan to also welcome people with an open arms and open mind too, yeah. And how much of your family still lives there? How many of your siblings stayed in Nan and how many grandchildren do they have? Like, is the whole town your family? (laughs) No, 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 not the whole town. The family home, it's now an abandoned home when I'm not there. There's nobody that lives there, which is really sad because when I saw it this year, it was full of bats. Bats have moved in because there's no one there. And now we've invited them to go elsewhere, rehome them. My siblings, I only have one, two, three siblings left. One younger and two older. Everyone else has died. But nieces and nephews are in the hometown, in Nan, and they all have their businesses. My family business before my mother died, something that my father started, was selling petrol. And now everyone who has petrol station understand that this is business that is going to have to change. That's interesting. Yeah, unfortunately, electric vehicle hasn't arrived in Thailand yet, and there's no thoughts in the government, how to get the charging stations up. It's further down, maybe five years from now. But my nieces and nephews are mindful that selling petrol is no longer the thing to do. And so they're looking for other things to do. And one petrol station owner, a nephew, has decided to grow coffee. So he's bought up hillsides to to grow coffee. And so Nan is the producer of Arabica, coffee beans of Thailand, and has become quite well-known. They're very excited, they're very proud that the last APEC summit in Bangkok, they use Arabica coffee from Nan to serve all the dignitaries. Yes. So, yeah, people are still in Nan. They're still going about their businesses, and my nieces and nephews are, the, are all in business. Yeah. In Castlemaine, you have a beautiful property and a lovely big house, and you've got a garden where you grow many of your own vegetables. Tell me a little bit about how you relate to being in central Victoria. Mm. I really love being here. The biggest challenge for being here is the weather, the climate of central Victoria that I am not accustomed to. So I am a new beginner again, learning how to farm, how to grow things. But what I've decided to grow in my garden is things that I use in my market meals for Wednesday. I can't grow everything that I use because I use a lot. Sometimes I serve as many as 100 meals on a Wednesday. And I'm happy to support the local farmers 
in things that they can grow better than I can. For example, cauliflower or carrots or broccoli, I buy from them. But I want to grow my own herbs. And my favorite herb is holy basil, or otherwise called t a u s i from India. It just makes Thai food to the level of authenticity that other basils don't do. I can substitute with Thai basil. I can even substitute with Italian basil, but it's not the same. So last year I was successful in growing a hundred plants of t a u s i but this year I've got six growing out there. And a hundred in little pots that decided that they don't want to grow. They've been one centimeter for the last two months, yeah. and they're not dead, but they're not growing. I like to grow enough quantity of one thing or two things that would be enough for my market meal. So out there, I have beans growing, and I grow 400 heads of garlic every year, and that is how much I use. I grow Asian greens. Oh, I just harvested the last of my snap peas, and it was a very prolific crop of snap pea. So I'm still learning of what will grow and what will not in this more hard climate. The part that I feel more profound is that <laughs> when I lived in research for 10 years, the First Nation people wasn't in the forefront of my mind, yeah. whereas here. I know every day that I'm on Cha Cha Wrong land, and that the Cha Cha people were here, and I am more interested in what would have grown here, you know, a thousand years ago, and what did they do with the crops that they use. I feel more akin, I guess, to the Cha Cha Wrong people. And one thing that is similar between the Thai culture. And the Cha Cha culture is the acknowledgement of past ancestors, the acknowledgement that people have lived here before. So in Thailand, we have spirit houses for people who have gone before us on the land, and not that we worship the spirit house, but it's just a reminder that we are not the first person here, that there's been people here before. And they deserve the credit for what is growing today, and so that was an easy transition for me, being a Thai, to come here. That there is acknowledgement of country, everywhere you go. I love that. I think that's so important. I think the feeling of gratefulness is one of the best way to feel. I think that makes me the person that I am today. I think is the fact that. I am reminded of everything that I've learned from other people. That I'm grateful before I'm entitled. In fact, I'm not entitled, but I'm grateful. Do you know what I mean? Is that when you start off a day being grateful, you can't fail. There's nothing that you can fail. It's a win-win situation. Mm-hmm. The hours forward from the time that you wake up is more gratefulness than not. I think that if I could influence one person to be more grateful rather than entitled, the person would be more happy, more more content. You feel it brings happiness. Yes, it brings contentment. I think, yeah. yeah. Keep you humble. And I think it also helps you feel connected and yes. less alone. Yes, yes, because there's always a cause to be grateful. And when I feel grateful, I feel like I'm on the bottom rung. And everything else is up here that I can look up to, rather than me being up there and look down upon what can be done for me. Yeah, it's just a good place to be. I hope you enjoyed today's episode with Duang. Links and notes about the show are in the episode description on the podcast and at saltgrasspodcast.com. And the links include Duong's website and the other interview I did with her as part of the SBS series called New Home. If you like today's episode, I recommend you listen. You'll hear different stories and moments from her life. Coming soon on Saltgrass are episodes where I catch up with the farmers from the Harcourt Cooperative. And a lot has changed out there over the last five years or so. So keep your ears open for those episodes. 
And don't forget to get your Saltgrass Ethical T-shirts, hoodies, stickers, posters and puzzles. And there are new designs all the time, so keep going back to the shop. You can find out more at saltgrasspodcast.com. Just click on the merch link. For those of you listening on the radio, please note that you can listen to all episodes of Saltgrass on your preferred podcasting app or at saltgrasspodcast.com. You can follow us on all the socials and you can subscribe to our email list to get reminders and updates about the show. This program was made possible with support from Main FM and the Community Broadcasting Foundation. Find out more at cbf.org.au. My name is Ali Hanley. Thanks for listening. So let me tell you this stir fry story mm. because we're not doing stir fry today. So you can write this down as a new recipe. Mm. <laughs> you can no no listen to me first because yeah. it might not be it might not be worth writing down. <laughs> <laughs> it will be. So I flew into Thailand and I had to be in quarantine and I had to be in quarantine on this island of Phuket. And I had never been to Phuket before and I'm not a, um, a beach person. So I thought, oh no, I'm just going to be in jail for one, for one week. And uh, so I went to my room and for the 21st, 24 hours I wasn't allowed to come out because the PC artist hadn't come back and the hotel that I stay at was made out of um, 20 foot container, oh, so it was quite con- con- confining. Oh. Mm. Was it hot? Yeah. Oh, yes, it was hot, it was air conditioned, but it was oh. claustrophobic, yeah. 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 Uh, and the last meal, that meal that night, I arrived in the morning, and for dinner that night, somebody passed me this bowl of stir fry and rice. And I thought, oh, this is just, you know, usually my stir fry, I don't consider my stir fry one, one of the best meals I could make. So looking at this stir fry, I was thinking of my own stir fry. <laughs> but because I was so hungry, I ate it. And I couldn't believe how good it is. Mm-hmm. It was so good. And it was made with wombok, you know. And I thought wombok is not one of my favorite vegetables for stir fry. I love it in soup. I thought, oh, how can they make, how could anybody make wombok taste this good? I'm going to have to cover this up or else we'll... It's, <laughs> it's quite pungent. Wombok. Wombok. Is that like um, bok choy or something? That kind of thing? It's, no? Yeah, it's a... It's a winter mm. vegetable. It's white, it's long. Yeah. Mm. It's, sort of it's like quite... Co- grows like a cos lettuce. Yeah. Like yeah. yeah. And it's yes. got a frilly... And they often use it in like kimchi and stuff. Yes. Oh, I know what you're correct. About, Yes, right. correct. In America, they call it Napa cabbage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And um, so, so when I got out of quarantine the next day, the first question I asked was, could I meet the chef? And they were they put up all kinds of reasons why I couldn't meet the chef. The the most um, crazy one was that the chef only spoke Southern Thai, and that I wouldn't be able to understand it. And uh, which is true, if he only yeah. spoke Southern Thai, I wouldn't be able to understand it because the dialects are quite different. Mm-hmm. But Still, I insisted, yeah. yeah, I insisted I wanted to. But the, the, the real reason they wouldn't, didn't want me to meet the cook was because they thought I would entice him to come to Australia <laughs> and, uh, and, and that I would steal oh, him. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, I. You just uh, wanted the recipe. The, the, for, the following, that, that day mm-hmm. in the evening, you know, I asked the, the owner of the hotel, I asked the waiters, I asked everybody, but nobody had any good reason for why I shouldn't see the, the... So for dinner that night, I was sitting at a table and I saw this man whom i never seen before mm-hmm. come by with plates of food and he put them down for the other tables. And when he passed my table, I said, are you the cook? And he said, yes. <laughs> and I, I told him how good that stir fry was. And he said, are you staying here? I said, yes, I have to be here for seven days. So I asked him a few more questions about food, and he said, why don't you just come into my kitchen? We'll cook together. Mm -hmm. So I spent the blissful seven days. I didn't want to leave. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And and so I asked him a few things that really stuck in my mind. One is about de-seeding chilies. I said, because his... um, his customers are all Westerners, right? Yeah, they go yeah. there. I said, for your Western customers, and they can't eat very hot food, what do you do with chilies with the seed? Mm. He said, 
if you take the seeds out of chili, it's like you take the soul out of a human. Yeah. There's nothing left. So he said, just use a small amount and add other kind of chilies that has no heat for the, for the aroma. So as I was de-seeding the chili this morning, he was sitting on my shoulder saying, what are you doing? <laughs> Salt of the earth people, grassroots change, salt grass. Listen to all episodes of Salt Grass on your podcast app or at saltgrasspodcast.com.